All right, let's talk some cricket now on the Sportsman Zone. The West Indies will look to break their 17-year winless run against South Africa when the second and final test bowls off in Guyana on Thursday. The Windies managed to pull off a draw in the first encounter with some assistance from the rain in Trinidad and Tobago. And coach Andre Coley knows that circumstances will change for the second encounter. Every test match is different. Uh, as you have said, we have moved to a different location, a different venue in Guyana. Uh, so we obviously have to plan uh, to suit based on the conditions, what we expect here. Yeah, the Jamaican also commented on Casey Carter's performance, 42 and 31 at number three, which has been a major problem for the Caribbean side. They have been talking with, with Casey for some time now, as I said before in, in previous interviews, uh, that you know, he had featured in, in, in a couple of A-team series uh, prior to his inclusion in the first test. Um, and the fact that he plays a similar role in the ODI side, um, you know, we see it as a straightforward move. Uh, yes, obviously we had Kirk McKenzie in that role at the time when we had given the opportunity. Um, and we just thought that uh, Casey's inclusion was the right time. Uh, and you saw from his intent uh, how he went about things. Uh, you know, he, he looked quite comfortable. Obviously he has to find his footing in red ball, uh, but we're confident that uh, he'll be able to make that adjustment. Yeah, time to draft in captain Fazir Mohammed to look ahead to Thursday start of the second test. Skip, how are you doing? Not too bad at all, Ricardo. Let's start with you giving us, I mean, your outlook for this second test, which starts tomorrow in Guyana. Well, I suppose, first of all, the concern will be whether or not the, the weather will be a factor, as it was uh, for the first test match, because we lost, in effect, uh, two full days of play. And as it turned out, uh, the West Indies five wickets down, over just over 200 runs, uh, chasing a daunting target uh, of 280. So, uh, it, you know, it, it really is going to be a situation where you would hope that the weather is a lot kinder uh, in, 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 in the South American mainland. And from what we've heard, the pitch is not going to be significantly different uh, from the, the, the reaction of the ground. Speaking, speaking to me today, suggested that it might be another one of those surfaces. And certainly, it's going to test the ability of the, the batters, like for long periods, to concentrate on periods, and also, uh, like bowlers, to be able to extract from a general. So that, that is going to be the going into this match for both teams. All right, so we seem to be having some issues with uh, Faz's audio. Um, Lance, while we try and get that sorted out, um, the West Indies pushing for victory on the final day of that rain-affected first test. I thought it was um, quite interesting that the West Indies, you know, in my opinion at least, decided to go after um, the total. Well, certain the, the way... Craig Brathwaite, the captain, got out on the final day, suggested as if they felt that the target was within reach um, in the 70 overs that they had to get it. And, and, and that was interesting for me because I think it says a lot about the mindset within the group, which is not a bad one, I think is a pretty good one, um, because I think based on the number of defeats um, the West Indians have had, they could easily on that final day have decided, you know what, let's safety block first. this out, safety, safety first. first. Yeah. And it didn't seem to be their approach. Yeah, which is, which is good. I, I, I think coach uh, Andre Coley has worked a lot with some of these, these players. And um, a lot of them are inexperienced at this level. And uh, to teach them or to guide them through a positive approach to their assignments cannot, as you just said, Ricardo, be a bad thing because you play sport to win. Yeah. And uh, you just hit a very important note there when you said that the West Indies win-loss record is unimpressive to the extent that you would actually like to see them turn some of these losses into drawn results, which could have been their approach with this, with this assignment that faced them on the final day in TNT. But they didn't. They went for the win. They played um, at their natural game. And it was refreshing to see them attempt that. Yeah, when I watched the team in England as well, I felt on a few occasions that the batsmen especially were uncertain as to the approach they should take, whether it should be a more defensive-minded approach or a more 
um, attacking approach. And I felt that on a number of occasions they got caught in two minds. But I think we have Faz back with us. Faz, um, from a selection standpoint, heading into the second test, a lot of talk about Shamar Joseph coming into the side. Of course, in Trinidad and Tobago, two spinners um, started. And it seems as if that might not be the case for the second test. What's your reading? Well, before we continue, hopefully you're hearing me uh, properly this time. Yes. <laughs> right. Uh, well, we've heard that Shamar Joseph has been added uh, to, to, the, to the 11, so you've got 12 there. Uh, therefore, you would expect him to play. That's why you add him uh, to the 12. The question is, are they going to arrest uh, Jaden Seals? Because that has been speculated during the course of the first test match, given the fact that he would have played five test matches over a period of six weeks, three in England, uh, and, and then one. But if he plays again, it'll be five test matches in six weeks. So that might be the other option. Uh, to, to rest Jaden Seals, let Shamar Joseph play, and you've got both Gotekesh Moti uh, together with Jomel Warikan, who had a very good test match as well. So that could very well be the option that they'll go with for this second test match. Yeah, and Faz, just to, building on the point that Ricardo and I made just now, when the, the approach by the West Indies batters on that last day was, was a positive one in application, um, first of all, did you see it that way yourself? And uh, how much do you think they would have taken from that as they go into the second test? Well, I, I think it's it's a bit disingenuous uh, to, to talk about, you know, the, the West Indies going for the win. Because let, let's be realistic about it. South Africa would not have declared at 173 for three uh, if they hadn't lost all that time. Uh, if it was a situation where there was so much more time available, they certainly would, would have batted on. They would have probably batted the West Indies out of the match completely. Maybe tried to build a lead, 350, 400, somewhere along along that line. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's convenient to talk in those terms because the West Indies finished at 201 for five. Uh, but credit, of course, to the, the batting of Ali Athanes, uh, for the debutant Casey Carty, uh, and uh, really the, the intention appeared to be there. But whether or not the West Indies would have had any realistic chance of getting up to 290 to win uh, in such a limited time, or maybe 350, 400, is just mere speculation. So uh, as it turned out, it allows both teams to talk about the prospect of having a chance to win that first test match. Yeah, and as you say that, Faz, um, the South African bowling attack is a, a, a pretty solid one, very, very potent. How would you assess the West Indies performance batting against them and the prospects for this Guyana test? I think a lot of that potency was blunted by the surface because Longi Ngidi, uh, who was very effective against the West Indies three years ago in St. Lucia on very different pitches, he was almost a non-entity because he's someone who gives you a bit of pace and bounce. Clearly, they relied heavily on the spin of Keisha Maraj, who virtually was bowling the entire test match as, as far as when the West Indies were batting. If it's going to be the same sort of surface in Guyana at Providence, then again, it will blunt the, the, the potency as far as the raw pace. But then, of course, you've got the experience of bowlers who are more adept at bowling consistent lines and lengths. And that's where you would expect Keshav Maharaj to have a lot of work to do again. Kagiso Rabada, likewise. I think Bayan Mulder would have been a disappointment for them too. So they would be maybe looking at some other bowling options going into the test match. On the West Indies side, again, it's about having that level of consistency on both sides, batting and bowling. Because once more, when you look at the scorecard with one or two exceptions, you see batters getting into the 20s, getting into the 30s, in the case of Casey Carter, getting into 42 in his first test innings, and then getting out. And that is the most disappointing thing about it, because for a lot of these players, the challenge is to come to terms with the requirements of test cricket, which is batting for long periods, which requires long periods of concentration. So I think that is the challenge, Lance, for both teams. And, and in reference to the potency of the South African attack, I think if they can remain consistent then they'll really challenge the ability of the relatively young West Indies batters to retain their concentration for long periods. Yeah, Faz, I wanted to get your take on the rotation policy. We have seen it being employed with different international teams, um, Australia, um, maybe England more so than any other team in the world. We've seen it with India as well. It seems as if the West Indies may be catching on as well. Note that Alzara Joseph did not play in the opening test and it was said that he has not been dropped. 
um, that he has been arrested. And now we hear talk that um, Jaden Seals might be arrested for the second test as well. Your own thoughts based on where the West Indies are in the international game on whether this is the way to go? Well, it might be that they don't have a choice uh, as far as the amount of cricket that is played and the franchise cricket and the demands in the franchise leagues. You don't want players breaking down uh, because if you're playing, for example, as in this case, five test matches in six weeks, especially if you're talking about your fast bowlers, bowling long, tiring spells in hot conditions, it could take a toll. But I think Ricardo and Lance, the bigger issue here is this rotation thing is devaluing test cricket. Because let's hope that Kimar Roach gets to 300 test wickets. But let's think about it. Would he be the last West Indies bowler ever to get 300 test wickets? If Craig Brathwaite, by next year, plays his 100th test match, would he be the last to ever play 100 test matches? Uh, and therefore, when you talk about the records and the history, because that's what test cricket is about. It's been around since 1877. West Indies have been playing since 1928. And, and people look at those numbers and those achievements. And when you have a situation where, as you said quite correctly, other countries have been doing it for quite some time already, but that doesn't change the fact that if you're considering test cricket to be your premier product, and you are resting your best players occasionally to manage them effectively, you're devaluing the product. Mm. Even if you have the depth, Faz, or you even feel you even have if, it? Even, it doesn't matter, um, Ricardo, because in, in the same way, you wouldn't say, well, you know, okay, uh, Usain Bolt has won <laughs> 200 meters. Let's rest him for 2016 <laughs> Rio, shall we? And give somebody else a chance. Do you think that would happen? <laughs> Thankfully, it didn't. <laughs> Precisely. Lance, I yeah. think Faz is all yours. <laughs> Faz, this will be the first test match at the Providence ground in, in 13 years. And uh, there is the feeling that given that uh, what we've seen from the pitch conditions in the regional first-class season, batting isn't very easy in, in Ghana. You already um, put forward the fact that the, the weather might be a factor as well. Um, how much do you think pitch conditions will impact on this game? It's, it's going to be significant. I think the pitch is always significant, uh, Lance, in, in both ways. Whether it's a minefield for batters and they struggle, or whether it's dead flat and there's very little in it that makes for an exciting spectacle. What you would hope for is the sort of surface that encourages both sides of the coin. That if you bowl well, you've got a chance of getting wickets. If you bat properly and you bat attacking and an attacking nature, you'll get runs. Often that doesn't happen. And, and therefore, it's going to be another test for the authorities. Because as you said, first test match, what, for 13 years at, at Providence, that's a very long time. We see the Queen's Park Oval gradually losing its, its, its stature as, as a te an automatic test match venue. The last four last nine years, there have only been four test matches played at Queen's Park Oval. Three of them have been rain-affected draws. And in Guyana, where the, you would hope that the appetite for the game is much greater than what we saw with those deserted stands at Queen's Park Oval, that they'll get the sort of spectacle as far as the nature of the pitch. But yes, if you're going by the scores in the domestic game, in the regional game, that would be a concern. But I would hope and I would expect that for the test pitch, that there would be a lot more preparation, a lot more put into it to ensure that it has what it takes as far as life early on, encouragement early on for the faster bowlers. And then as it gets better and better and deteriorates, it allows other elements of the game, uh, spinners, uh, bat batters to spend more time in the crease, be challenged on a turning track and so on. All of these elements make up for what we can constitute a decent test match surface. Yeah, and Faz, before we go, you have said repeatedly on this show that you don't bet, you don't gamble. Uh, Kagisa Brabada is five wickets away from 300 test wickets. Um, do you think he'll get it in this test I match? Think, I think he'll get it in this test match because he is that sort of quality bowler. Uh, he was blunted again by the surface at Queen's Park Oval, but we saw he came back with the second new ball in the West in his first innings and even in the second innings. So I think that he will join the ranks of those with 300 test wickets come this guy in the test match. Yeah, the surface, the surface, the surface. I tell you what, I love the surfaces in Australia, most of them at least, because it's always a good contest between bat and ball. Faz, thanks very much. We'll be chatting again throughout the course of this week as we watch the second test between the West Indies and South Africa. Take care until then. Take care, gentlemen. All right, Fazir Mohammed, the skipper, captain of the Sportsmax cricket team. Let's take a break. We'll be back with more after this.